Good afternoon, and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Jan Roller, a past president of the City Club's Board of Directors. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Catherine Spiller, executive director of the Feminist Majority Foundation and executive editor of Ms. Magazine. Eric Garner, Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, Sandra Bland. These are names we know, names we hear in the news nearly every day. Names that are evidence of the ongoing struggle between police officers and the citizens they serve. Legal settlements between the Department of Justice and local police departments, known as consent decrees, have increased at least 50% since 2009, according to the Fraternal Order of Police. Cleveland is not immune. On May 26th, the city of Cleveland entered into a consent decree with the Department of Justice following a two-year investigation into the police department's use of, ex of excessive force. As the crisis continues to unfold in communities across the country, a variety of solutions have been offered. Proponents of reform believe that including body cameras, increasing training, implementing stricter use of force policies, and enhancing community engagement will reduce the occurrence of violence. It's also becoming increasingly clear that hiring the right types of police officers is imperative to improving police community relations. Is it possible that the right police officers are female? Can changing the gender composition of police forces result in decreased police brutality? Our speaker today thinks so. In her roles at the Feminist Majority Foundation at Min and Ms. Magazine, Ms. Spiller is working for women's equality empowerment, and nonviolence. As one of the foundation's founders in 1987, she has been a driving force in executing its diverse programs, securing women's rights both domestically and globally. She is a trained economist and researcher and a specialist in community organizing. Ms. Spiller has been a national leader in the struggle to counter the effects of extremist anti-abortion groups that target women's reproductive health clinics. She played an instrumental role in the Feminist Majority Foundation's landmark 1994 Supreme Court decision, upholding the use of court-ordered buffer zones to protect clinics and continues to oversee the Foundation's litigation efforts to stop violent extremists. Ms. Spiller holds a bachelor's degree in urban studies from Texas Christian University and a Master of Science interdisciplinary degree in economics and urban studies from Trinity University. Before becoming active in women's rights, Ms. Spiller was Director of Public Policy Research and Economics for a statewide trade association in California. She hails from Los Angeles, California. Ladies and gentlemen, members and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, please welcome our speaker today, Kathy Spiller. Thank you, Jan. Um, and I, I'm so thrilled to be here today, and I want to thank the City Club for this incredible opportunity, uh, especially Jan, a past president of the City Club, and Lana Moreski, a longtime friend uh, and a feminist leader here in Cleveland and Ohio. And I want to thank and recognize Senator Nina Turner for being here today as well. Um, she is now heading up the Collaborative for Police Community Relations here in the state of Ohio, and I think is destined to play a very, very important role as we we move forward. This is a prestigious opportunity to, I hope uh, and I think, uh, put out probably some very thought-provoking ideas uh, to add to the public conversation that has consumed this city and indeed much of the country over the last many months um, since really Ferguson exploded into our national consciousness. We, as uh, Jan said, uh, you know, not only Ferguson, but New York City, Charleston, uh, South Carolina, Baltimore, Cincinnati, just this past week, and here in Cleveland. And then there's the not so high profile of the killings of mostly blacks by white police officers, 304 killed in, 200, in 2014, last year. Most of their names we'll never know, 101 of them unarmed. That's according to a project called MappingPoliceViolence.org. It seems to be the only national compilation of the stats on police use of lethal force. 
And of course, we've all witnessed now um, on television and, and read in the newspapers the horrific police abuse of a young woman in Texas two weeks ago, Sandra Bland, on her way to a new job. Uh, we witnessed uh, her pulled over for failing to signal a lane change. Uh, and three days later, death in the county jail, the cause much disputed to this day. What is it going to take to overhaul a justice system that is permitting this kind of police brutality with impunity? What to do about this country's police brutality problem? As you know, here in Cleveland, following an eight-month investigation, the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Northern District of Ohio found that there was reasonable cause to believe that the Cleveland Division of Police engages in a pattern or practice of using excessive force, and that systemic deficiencies in operational and structural areas of the department contributed to the excessive force problems. Among the report's most disturbing findings I believe, are that CDP officers do not effectively de-escalate situations, either because they do not know how or because they have an inadequate understanding of the importance of de-escalating encounters uh, before you have to use force. And so it's no surprise that that U.S. Attorney's report found that CDP's failure to engage in effective community policing has led communities, especially the black community, feeling as though they are under siege by the police. Instead of protecting their communities, officers are seen as an occupying force there to control through fear, fostering distrust and reducing cooperation. The city of Cleveland has now entered into a consent decree to make numerous changes in how it oversees, regulates, investigates, and reviews uh, the operations of the Cleveland Division of Police. The decree outlines a whole framework to implement community-oriented policing, and the decree addresses at great length changes in the use of force policies and training by the department and how the department will oversee and investigate and deal with excessive force incidents. These are all important aspects of the reforms that must be made in the Cleveland Division of Police to deal with the problem of excessive force and distrustful and soured community relations. But I believe among the most important reforms and some of the most easily overlooked are the changes that the Cleveland Division of Police must make in its recruitment and hiring practices. Why do I say these might be some of the most important changes that can be made? Because it gives this city an unprecedented opportunity to racially diversify the department, a department where two-thirds of the officers are white in a city that is two-thirds non-white, but to also dramatically increase the percentages of women in the police department, currently only 14%. And by dramatically, I mean to gender balance the ranks of the Cleveland police. Let me explain why I say that hiring more women is such a critical piece of solving a police excessive force problem. I think the best place to start is with a question recently posed by David Cooper, highly respected former chief of police of Madison, Wisconsin. He asked, haven't you ever wondered why women police are not the ones involved in the recent killings. After all, they are usually smaller in stature, somewhat weaker in physical strength, and yet they don't appear to shoot suspects as often. In fact, over the last 40 years, studies have shown that on the whole, women officers are less authoritarian in their approach to their policing style than male officers less reliant on physical force, and are more effective communicators. Most importantly, the research shows that women officers have proven to be better at diffusing potentially violent confrontations before those encounters turn deadly. The earliest studies on women police were prompted by widespread speculation, beginning in the early 1970s when women first began to join police departments in any numbers, speculation that they would fail as patrol officers and that the public would not accept their presence or authority. One of the first wide-scale studies in 1974 by the Police Foundation 
found that women are equally capable as patrol officers, performing the, their patrol work in a generally similar manner as men, while encountering the same kinds of situations involving angry, drunk, and violent individuals, they're doing the same kind of policing. They're equally capable. But the study's most important finding was that, quote, women act less aggressively and they believe in less aggression. And so the researchers predicted as early as 1974 that the presence of women might stimulate increased attention to the ways of avoiding violence and cooling out violent situations without having to resort to use of force. Subsequent studies have reached the same conclusions. In a 1988 article in the Journal of Police Science and Administration, researcher Joseph Balkin reviewed 14 years worth of US and international research on women in policing and found uniformly Women not only perform the job of policing effectively, they are better able to defuse potentially violent situations. Now, why is this? There seem to be two major reasons for this fundamental difference between the way women and men police. According to Balkan's research, and I quote, police men see police work as involving control through authority. That is their definition of policing while police women see it as a public service. In other words, the type of man that we're attracting typically, not all men, to policing are more authoritarian in their personalities. Women at heart are social workers. <laughs> a second research area, which is very interesting and not a lot of research has been done yet, but suggests that male police officers who feel that they must demonstrate their masculinity might be more inclined to use force against a subject. And we certainly saw that play out right before our eyes in the video recording of the police officer's interaction with Sandra Bland in Texas. In fact, it's this latter factor that was a key finding of the 1992 Christopher Commission report on police brutality in the Los Angeles Police Department. That commission was created following the Rodney King beating and the disastrous and devastating Los Angeles riots in response to the not guilty verdicts of the officers charged in his beating. The Christopher Commission found that, quote, virtually every indicator examined established that female LAPD officers are involved in excessive force at rates substantially below those of male officers. A key explanation the commission offered for why this was so was that many officers that they interviewed, both male and female, both male and female, believe that female officers are less personally challenged by defiant suspects and feel less need to deal with that defiance with the immediate use of force or confrontational language. What's more, the commission concluded, and this is critical, that it's the underrepresentation of women in police departments that is exacerbating the use of excessive force because it creates a disdain for women's less aggressive and less authoritarian approach to policing. The Christopher Commission studied the role of gender in its investigation of the LAPD because the Feminist Majority Foundation, which has West Coast offices in Los Angeles, advocated that gender be examined. And because the one woman on the commission out of 10, one woman out of 10, thought that it might be important to examine gender, proving once again the importance of having women at the decision-making tables. As a result of this work, the Feminist Majority Foundation formed the National Center for Women in Policing to conduct research on the impact of women in policing and to advocate for changes in recruiting and hiring practices by police departments. Our 2002 study of excessive force incidents in five major city police departments, including Los Angeles, Cincinnati, San Jose, California, San Francisco, and Washington, D.C. Metro, found that the average male officer is over eight and a half times more likely than his female counterpart to have an allegation of excessive force sustained against him. Eight and a half times more likely than his female counterpart. 
and he is two to three times more likely than the average female officer to have a citizen name him in a complaint of excessive force. Even more recent data, spanning 2004 to 2014, so very current, from Denver, Indianapolis, Washington, D.C. Metro, and Kansas City Police Departments reflect these same results. Women are named proportionately less often than their numbers on the department would suggest, proportionately less often than male counterparts in excessive force complaints. Now, despite this evidence, that increasing women in law enforcement could significantly reduce police violence. The number of women in policing remains stuck at very low levels. As of 2007, which is the most recent data available from the Bureau of Justice Statistics, local police departments average just 12% women in their ranks, barely higher than the 7.6% 20 years earlier. Not much progress. Only 11.2% of sheriff's officers are women, and an even smaller 6.5% of state uh, police officers are women. Some of the smallest police agencies in this country have no women, and the vast majority of all agencies have only token numbers of women at the top. Larger police departments average slightly higher, around 18%. But that's only because they have been under 20, 30 years of consent decrees, mandating the hiring of more women. These decrees came about in the late 70s and early 80s as a result of race and sex discrimination, class action lawsuits lodged by the National Organization for Women and by the NAACP. And what we have seen recently is as these consent decrees that mandated the hiring of more people of color and more women have begun to expire, the departments are beginning to slip backwards in their representation. In fact, the Pittsburgh Police Department uh, was under a consent decree to hire up to 40% women. And the minute that decree expired, the very next academy class had no women. That's how quickly we can go backward. The Cleveland Division of Police has 14% women in its ranks, 14.4%. And by the way, the women officers are the most racially diverse members of this department. 39% are blacks, 13% are Hispanics, and 45% are whites. Among male officers, 69% are white. So why aren't there more women police and police departments across the country? Well, if you ask most police officials, some in this room, um, the exception, they will tell you it's because women don't want to be police officers. It's simply not true. The top three reasons why there aren't more women police are misguided recruiting programs, ongoing discriminatory hiring practices, and hostile workplaces. What do I mean by misguided recruiting programs? Too many recruiting programs are featuring this old-style adrenaline-fueled car chases, SWAT incidents, helicopter rescues. That's the one that just came out from the L.A. Sheriff's Department. The kind of policing featured in television dramas, which overwhelmingly appeals to young male recruits. In reality, 80 to 95 percent of police work involves nonviolent, service-related activities, interactions with the public, and with the community to solve problems, the very kind of policing that appeals to females, the kind of policing involved, by the way, in community-oriented, non-biased policing. Another problem with recruiting is that it, often recruiting teams are targeting military populations. Not only are military populations not a good place to find women, we're still less than 20 percent of most branches of, of the military because of quotas that kept us out for so many years. But most importantly, and I want to emphasize this, and this is coming from police executives who also served in the military, there is nothing about military training that translates into policing unless what you want is a paramilitary police force. Nothing. Second, the tests used all too often in the selection and hiring of police recruits are also a problem. Based on the discredited presumption 
discredited presumption that brute strength is a key requirement for successful performance as a police officer, the vast majority of police agencies to this day use physical abilities testing in their hiring process. Too often these tests are not gender or age normed, and they tend to emphasize upper body strength, thus disqualifying many women, and by the way, slight stature men. The use of so-called physical agilities tests, by the way, only came into vogue in the 1970s when the EEOC prohibited the use of minimum height requirements for police agencies. Yes, that's right, in the early 70s, it was widely believed that you had to be 5'11 or 6 feet or taller to possibly perform as a police officer. So again, most women and short men were eliminated even from trying. So when police agencies could no longer use minimum height requirements to keep women off the department, suddenly upper body strength became the defining test. And the most frequent one that is still used in many agencies across the country is this thing called the six-foot wall. So there's a six-foot wall. You have to run up to the wall, grab to the top, pull yourself up and over the wall. That's to get on the department. Now, it's my understanding, I've never done that, but that you can actually, that's a technique that you can actually teach. Um, so if you've gone through the right training, you can probably do it. But why would you do it? Because one of the first things you're going to be taught in the academy is that you never go up a six-foot wall that you can't see on the other side. <laughs> and not only that, if it was really a requirement for policing, why doesn't every police officer every year have to demonstrate they can do it? <laughs> it is clearly not a qualification, and so why is it done? It isn't, and that's the point. But most importantly, in study after study, physical strength has never been shown to predict a police officer's effectiveness or ability to handle dangerous situations, never. In fact, as we all watched in horror the video of Eric Garner being choked and literally wrestled to the ground by five white male police officers in New York, it is clear that brute strength is not an asset. It is a potential liability, not only to police departments, but to the citizens in their communities. So instead of so heavy a focus on physical agilities testing, testing should focus on an applicant's communication skills their ability to diffuse potentially violent uh, situations and maintain composure under conflict. And third and finally, as in the military and other traditionally male-dominated workplaces, sexual harassment and negative male attitudes are a major problem in police departments. Too many male officers continue to hold the view that women shouldn't and can't be police officers. And if you're sexually harassed in a police department, and you speak up about it and complain, as it is your right. In fact, police departments are supposed to, as all employment uh, uh, employers, to maintain a sexually harassment-free workplace. But if you speak up as a woman officer and you get into a situation where you need backup and you call for backup, and they're now retaliating against you for complaining, the message is pretty clear. Don't complain, endure the harassment, or leave the department. So despite persistent negative male officer attitudes towards women officers, surveys of the public have shown that community members prefer officer teams with both a woman and a man, prefer gender-balanced officer teams because they believe women are better able to diffuse potentially situations and they feel that women are more approachable. And so the trust factor is very, very important. So I would say it's impossible for the Cleveland Division of Police to develop a comprehensive and integrated community-oriented policing model if it continues to have such a deficit of women in its ranks. And, of course, when the department fails to represent the racial diversity of this city. In fact, most of the discourse has been around racial diversity, and I think it's easy for people to understand the importance of that. And as the consent decree points out, and as the uh, investigation by the U.S. Attorney points out, 
having police from all sections of the, of the larger community to understand the problems of each community and to represent those communities within the police department is very critical. We're, we talk about, and, and this term is used in the consent decree, cultural competency, cultural competency on the police department. It's not as obvious at first why it's so important to have significant numbers of women on the force. But if you think about it, there are cultural competency aspects to women's lives and how our lives intersect with policing. Take the issue of domestic violence. Women are disproportionately the victims of domestic violence. You may not know this, but it's the number one largest category of calls to 911 all across the country, domestic violence calls. Women police officers have shown they're more responsive in these situations. They take the situation more seriously. Uh, and all too often, if two men show up, in response to the call, that hasn't been the case. In fact, the women's rights movement had to get laws passed to mandate arrests of domestic violence perpetrators because all too often the arrests were not occurring. Or take rape and sexual assault crimes. Again, women and girls are disproportionately the victims. And again, experience shows that the underrepresentation of women in policing means that these crimes are given less priority. We've just lived through a period where it's become now obvious. Tens of thousands of rape evidence kits have never been processed in this country. Right here in Cleveland, the police sent the last of 3,985 rape kits to the state crime lab for testing, clearing a backlog of untested rape evidence kits stretching back to 1993. So far, according to newspaper accounts, that has resulted in the indictments of nearly 170 men. If you understand that rape is a serial crime, that rapists commit serial rapes, by analyzing and investigating the crimes and taking these perpetrators off the streets, the community is safer. Again, women on a police department change the priorities of the department. So that's why we need more women to achieve a department that better serves the needs of all of Cleveland's people. And women police have proven better, on the whole, than men at de-escalating potentially violent confrontations. So in my opinion, some of the most important portions of the consent decree deal with the recruiting and hiring practices of the CDP. The CDP is going to have to reform its recruitment and hiring practices that have resulted in a police department that not only grossly underrepresents women, but also black and Hispanic men. The city's goal, I urge, must be to gender balance the ranks of your police department. And by that, I mean 50%. 50%. After all, we are half the population, and we're half the paid workforce, and we have been for some time. And of course, the goal must be the racial and ethnic makeup of the police department reflect this community. I was given a copy of the Department of Public Safety Uniform Recruitment Strategy, their PowerPoint presentation, when I was here in March of this year. It reviews current recruitment uh, and uh, key recommendations and reforms Talks about shortening the hiring process, creating a permanent recruitment team, engaging the community to identify candidates for the police department. All very, very important recommendations. But I have to be honest, one thing caught my eye that has suggested uh, among the suggested recruitment objectives, and I quote, increase the number of qualified female candidates for the position within public safety. Qualified. But nowhere in the plan does it talk about whether male applicants should be qualified. Now, I don't think the creator of that PowerPoint meant anything by that. I just think it reflects this underlying assumption that women are not as qualified to be police officers as men. We've got to look at those assumptions. Because clearly, the problem has not been unqualified women on the force. It has been unqualified men. The Feminist Majority Foundation's National Center for Women in Policing has compiled a detailed resource document on how to recruit and hire more women officers. I've shared that with uh, Cleveland City officials and am uh, willing to do even more uh, to provide that resource and to provide access to 
uh, departments across the country that have been dealing with this same problem. How do you recruit more women? But the five most important things that can be done, a community policing philosophy, which is what the department must become. That is the kind of policing that women want to be a part of, not the old model of warriors over-relying use of force. An unrelenting and genuine commitment from the top of the department and from city leaders to gender balance and hire more women officers. Non-discriminatory testing and hiring procedures. Recruiting practices that focus on women and incentives for existing officers to bring women to the department. Uh, the one thing you know about policing, and it's everywhere, is that most people join the department because an existing officer on the department suggested it might be a good job for them. Urge them to apply. Well, then use your recruiting budget instead of brochures and fairs and everything else that policing does. And in Los Angeles, we have very slick television ads and billboards and all kinds of things. Pay bonuses to officers who bring a woman to the department successfully through the academy and probation. Think about a financial incentive, what that would do for mentoring her. They're going to be sure she's not sexually harassed out of the department. They're going to be sure she gets the training and the attention that she needs. And you're going to very quickly see many more women becoming police officers. And finally, departments must enforce sexual harassment policies that keep women from being hazed and threatened out of the department. Two quick things, and then I will finish. The charter amendment, uh, is man a charter amendment is mandated by the consent decree uh, to be developed and placed on the ballot to give greater flexibility in the selection of candidates for the CDP. That charter amendment must allow for targeted recruitment of women and men of color if the city is to have any hope of diversifying the ranks of the police department. All of my focus has been on the recruitment and hiring practices. I don't want to minimize the work that will be done to provide better training and better and stricter use of force policies. Nor do I want to minimize the importance of the new accountability structures that are being put in place. In fact, I want to say two things about these accountability structures. I urge that as part of the monitoring and accountability that the city collect, analyze, and report data on police excessive force cases by the gender of the officer involved, as well as the gender and the race of the subject. You will see very quickly the statistics emerge that show you the positive benefit of more women on the police department. Secondly, I want to urge that the Community Police Commission's 13 members be gender balanced. Mayor Jackson and U.S. Attorney Dettelbach are to be commended for gender balancing the selection panel that will be making nominations. This next round is going to be more challenging. I hope the selection panel will heavily weight their nominations to women because two of the three remaining commission members are to be appointed by the Cleveland Patrol Men's Association and the fraternal order of police. And the chances that either one of them will be women are pretty slim, although they might surprise us. But the most central and fundamental change a police agency can make is who it hires, and it has to hire the right people, hiring the right balance of people. And it is the current imbalance or the gender gap that in the makeup of the CDP that is contributing to the police excessive force problems in this city and indeed across the country. Cleveland is not unique in this. My comments apply nationwide. And until this changes, the inherent gender bias in policing that exacerbates the use of violence will continue. Until now, the national conversation on what to do about police brutality has left gender out. We must not miss that opportunity here in Cleveland. With demands for police reform echoing from the streets to the city halls, to the White House and the President and the Department of Justice and local public leaders, including here in Cleveland, you have a perfect opportunity to consider a dramatic gender-based response to the problem of police brutality. I hope you will. Thank you. Today we are enjoying a Friday Forum featuring Catherine Spiller, 
Executive Director of the Feminist Majority Foundation and Executive Editor of Ms. Magazine. We encourage you to organize your questions for our speaker now and remind you that your question should be brief and to the point. If you are joining us via our live broadcast on WCPN or on our webcast and would like to tweet a question, please tweet it at, at the City Club. We welcome all of you here and those joining us via radio broadcast and web stream provided by our primary media partner, 90.3 WCPN, WVIZ PBS, 104.9 WCLV Idea Stream, or one of the many radio stations across the region and country that carry City Club programs. Um, and radio, web production and distribution is made possible by the Cleveland State University and PNC. Be sure to join us on Friday, July 31st, for a conversation on the benefits of Social Security expansion with Nancy J. Altman, co-founder of Social Security Works. For more information about our upcoming and past forums, please visit us online. We're at cityclub.org. Today's program is the Cyrus Eaton Memorial Forum, made possible by a generous gift from the Cyrus Eaton Foundation. We thank you for our support. We welcome guests at tables hosted by the ACLU, of Ohio, the Cuyahoga Democratic Women's Caucus, and the North Shore AFL-CIO. We thank you all for your support. Now it's time to return to Catherine Spiller for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. Holding the microphones today are content associate Teddy Eisenberg, Teddy's over there with a the microphone, and City Club intern Wesley Allen, over here. So let's have our first question, please. Ms. Spiller, over here. Yes. Uh, in the United States, we don't generally look outside our country for any uh, examples or guidance to solve our problems. We want to solve them ourselves. But my question to you is whether in your studies of this problem of p police brutality, you have observed any police departments anywhere in the world I'm thinking particularly of Western Europe and the Scandinavian countries that have a more gender balanced police department and what have the results been of that situation? Thank you. To my knowledge, and, and uh, we have uh, attended conferences of the International Association of Women Police um, who meet uh, annually, uh, there are no police departments across the world um, that I'm aware of that have reached gender balance in its ranks. There are a couple of examples, though, uh, that I can give. Uh, for example, in Brazil, the problem of domestic violence is epidemic and deadly. And what the police departments were finding is that women were afraid to approach police officers uh, to report domestic violence because all too often the police, police uh, men uh, just shrugged their shoulders and said, what did you do to provoke it? Uh, not unlike what we've had right here in this country from time to time. Uh, so Brazil actually created all female police districts uh, that were specifically designed for women to come and report domestic violence problems. And it was the only way that they could begin to aggressively deal with the situation. That's one example. Second example is in Liberia, after the civil war there was finally settled. Woman president, um, uh, Shirley Johnson, uh, had all female peacekeeping forces uh, from different countries as part of the UN peacekeeping to establish peace again throughout the country because violence against women, again, was at epidemic proportions because of the civil war. And she felt it was necessary for all female teams of peacekeepers um, to be a critical part of reestablishing peace and civil society in that country. So those are the only two examples that I can give you. Unfortunately, everywhere, uh, the domain of policing has been a male domain, by and large, with very rare exception. But the research internationally is the same. Uh, these statistics that I said today play out in every country in every police department. Uh, the research is, is decisive um, and consistent no matter where we are, in this country or any other country in the world. 
I just wanted to ask you, do most departments have a citizenship requirement in order to apply? The reason I'm asking that is it takes many years for a person once they come here to meet the qualifications to become a citizen. I'm just wondering if green card status might be enough to uh, get the person in the door because they can make a tremendous contribution. Number one, they know a different language. Number two, they really embrace the values of this country, immigrants do. You know, I don't know the answer to that question. I think you would have to ask uh, police officials. Um, uh, so unfortunately, I don't. But I think your point is well taken, that the diversity of a department is critical uh, to understanding uh, the different parts of a community and the different histories of a community and dealing with law enforcement and interacting with law enforcement. Again, speaking to the need for broad diversity within police departments, both race, ethnicity, uh, language, and gender. We have a question from Twitter, actually. Uh, at Natural Log Cubed would like to know uh, and hear the benefits from having female police officers uh, involved when it comes to sexual assault crimes. Female officers in sexual assault crimes, very, very critical. I mean, we've, I, I mentioned the lack of attention to processing rape evidence kits uh, as, one, as one example, a very a uh, horrific example of the lack of attention to these crimes that disproportionately affect women and the lack of, of uh, dis women decision makers within these agencies to make sure those kits were processed. But I know that uh, uh, very often women who have been victimized uh, sexual assault uh, would like to deal with a woman officer in filing the report. We know that, uh, and we've studied widely recently, the whole problem of, of sexual assault on college campuses. And by the way, um, campus police agencies are also overwhelmingly male. And too many students have said that as they've gone to report the rape, the questions that begin about, well, what were you doing at the time that you were raped? What, did, did you put yourself in that position? Was it really rape? What, what do you, what, why do you think it's rape? Um, again, a cultural competency issue when it comes to how women's lives intersect with law enforcement. So I think when you have crimes that disproportionately impact women, uh, being able to have more women on a police department that, number one, might even understand the origin of those problems. And many, many women police officers have come out of homes where domestic violence was the issue that got them interested in becoming police officers. So you have an additional element of cultural competency with women in policing. My question will also be about hiring practices. Recently at the fifth annual Cuyahoga County Conference on Social Welfare, Margaret Mitchell, President and CEO of the YWCA, also supported your call for more female police officers. But she also made a lot of very well-received points to us social workers in the crowd uh, about the need to hire um, more social workers in police departments. Um, and I'm wondering if you could comment a bit on the role of ancillary non-officer staff as part of the hiring practices uh, to improve our overall impact of our police hiring. Thank you. I think that's an important part is having those kinds of um, competencies uh, either available to police uh, officers or part of the police force themselves. In Los Angeles County, our district attorney, a black woman, um, first uh, black woman district attorney in Los Angeles, has just uh, begun to establish a whole series of mental health clinics um, to 20% of the incarcerated population in Los Angeles County are mentally ill individuals. They don't belong in jails. They belong in treatment facilities. And so here's a woman who has made a real change in the way the district attorney's office and the sheriff's department are going to begin to deal with these problems. But I can't think of a better place, really, to recruit women or men than schools of social work to come into policing. To, to become police officers, in addition to being available through um, adjunct uh, 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 personnel to a department to be part of the department. Uh, it's a whole different mindset about what it takes to work with a community to solve a community's problems. That is what community-oriented policing is. It's problem-solving policing. Who best to help a community solve problems of violence uh, and poverty 
uh, than social workers. Um, again, it's, it's changing the entire culture of a department uh, to which uh, more people with social work backgrounds are going to be attracted, both women and men, both women and men. I rise to ask a question about strategic rhetoric. It's almost impossible to avoid raising the issue of police brutality. But if you let that be your peg on which this topic hangs, do you not miss the opportunity to do what you've done so well just now and in your number one objective, which is to talk about community policing? That the women, it's not just that the men have more misbehavior, but that the women are literally more effective. So if your goal is to have an effective department, if your goal is effective community policing, you need more women in order to be more effective. That's a different rhetorical choice than saying, here's a way to remedy a bad problem. I'm saying you get two for the price of one. <laughs> yeah. By uh, including more women on the department, you're addressing uh, a uh, police brutality problem, but you're also creating a more community responsive department. Uh, a department that will be in more involved with the community because the residents of the community are telling you they like dealing with women police officers. They feel they're more approachable. Uh, they're not in fear when they approach them. And so if you really want to work with a community to solve problems, you've got to have more women on the department. And you've got to get to a critical mass of women on the department to see the real benefits of the changes. So it can't be getting to just 20%. We have got to set our sights higher. We've got to set our sights on 50%. We must represent the entire community of Cleveland and of communities all across this country. So we can't settle uh, for less than full, equal numbers in our police departments. I just was wondering if the issue you're raising, um, if you found active resistance and kind of an issue of sexism and tradition, or is it simply an issue of education and realization that this is a solution? So are you finding, which is? I'm looking behind you at a couple of people. Um, <laughs> okay. The resistance is severe. Um, I've never received such comments as when I um, either speak or write about this issue. But there is organized resistance within police departments to women. When we were working with the Christopher Commission to investigate the LAPD for excessive use of force, there was an active organization within the department called MA, Men Against Women. The harassment that women officers face on the job, unlike almost any other type of a workplace is, as I said, life-threatening, and they know it. Um, we've got to get past that, and the only way past it is leadership at the very top of the department and city officials. The public is there. You know, d don't buy that the public doesn't want women officers or doesn't think they can do their job. All the research shows just the opposite. They prefer gender-balanced teams. It is mostly male police officers who are the most resistant to the idea of more women. It's this masculinity factor I talked about. It's their very identity is threatened if a woman can do the job, as well, if not better. So it is going to take real persistent commitment by this city to overcome those objections. Um, and I, I, I think it can be done, and you can see how critical it's to be done. These are, these are situations where people are losing their lives because some guy couldn't back off and say, okay, wait a minute, is this really worth me shooting some kid to death? And that's what we have to overcome. You mentioned, I believe, that the Pittsburgh Police uh, Department had a 40% women and, until the consent a decree. Man, uh, decree. A mandated. Right. right, right. Is there any research on how that worked? That's 40% women on a police force. It's as close to your 50% mark that we can get. Uh, was it successful? And if not, why not? 
Uh, I don't have the data from, uh, from that period, but I can tell you all of the agencies that we look at, you see this very significant difference uh, in the way women uh, uh, are engaged in excessive force versus men. What we don't have is, is the overall studies to see whether once you hit a critical mass of women, the entire rates of police violence uh, committed by a department come down. That's the research, I think, that needs to be done. Um, and a, a tremendous contribution to this whole discussion would be not only if we collect data and report data by the gender of officers involved, but then track over time is the level of brutality or the police use of excessive force in a department declining as a result of a better diversity within its ranks. That's very critical uh, data that simply really hasn't been collected. One, we haven't had enough police departments that have even approached those numbers. But two, the minute we got close, the consent decree expired and we start the downward trend again. So um, I think it's a critical question that you ask, and I wish there was research that addressed it. But as of right now, there isn't. Uh, yes, I just have a question. When I came on the police department in, 19, in the 80s, the city was under a consent decree to uh, recruit, actively recruit minorities and women. That consent decree has since expired, and what I've noticed now is that we're going back to the old ways. We're seeing more men in police academies than females. As a matter of fact, the last couple of academies, we've had either one female or no females at all. Um, the other thing that has changed is the hiring standards. Uh, the city of Cleveland now is under the um, hiring standards of the Ohio Police Officer Training Academy in Columbus, which is a state agency. They've changed the physical um, uh, capability requirements now, and they've made it universal. So there is no difference now. They don't, ask, they don't re require a difference between physical capabilities, uh, you know, between Gender men and norm, women. Or, Everything yeah. is just across the board. Now, not only do I see fewer minorities in the police academies, I'm seeing fewer women. So how do you go about creating some kind of change in policy. What is it that needs to happen to change the policy? Thank you. That's a question for some people in this room. Um, uh, and it's part of what can be done, I think, through this charter amendment that is going to address the very issue of selection criteria and the kind of flexibility that a department needs to really get a representation in its ranks. But it's also the importance of what's being done statewide. Uh, Nina Turner uh, and the work that she is doing will address some of these statewide uh, mandates. But if we don't change from this old style of policing and the kinds of recruitment and qualification criteria and testing, uh, we'll never get to a more diverse police department and we'll never get to gender balance. And by the way, as I said, the research shows that some of these physical agilities tests have no relationship to policing. So why are we using them? And who are they excluding? And who do they favor? Those are the critical questions that we have to ask. I think Cleveland has the chance to confront those uh, head on and to get some change, both at the state level and at the local level. Thank you, Ms. Spiller, uh, for making some really um, things to ponder. As a, one of the city lit leaders, uh, you've opened my eyes, and the, the brother of five sisters, I appreciate uh, the comments that you've made. Um, separate from doing recruitment at social work schools, talk about what are some things that the city of Cleveland can do to recruit and, and r rise our ranks uh, in gender equity without, within our force. I think the first and most important is to make sure that women in this city know that we're talking about a new day in policing, a new type of police department here in Cleveland, one that is community engaged and community involved and problem solving. It's an entire change from where this department has been. Many aspects of this consent decree, which is extraordinarily detailed to address many of these issues, very specific recommendations on how to move towards this community-oriented, problem-solving model of policing versus this command and control use of force style of policing. When that new police persona becomes known, 
more women will want to be part of the department. But in the meantime, it's going to take a lot of conversations and a lot of work to reach women to make sure they understand that they're wanted in the department, that the skills they bring to the department are missing right now and desperately needed. I would suggest, too, you really take a hard look at your recruiting practices and, and where you go. You need to go where women are, um, to community centers. I would talk to uh, child care centers and child care workers. I would talk to community college professors. I would be on those community colleges. Women are 60, 65, sometimes 70 percent of community college students. They want these jobs. These are good jobs. These are jobs with a career path. Many times they pay far more than you can earn in the private sector. Uh, and right now, women are not thinking about becoming police officers. So it's going to take a real concerted effort. It's not going to be easy, but you're going to have to change some of the fundamental things you do to get more women in this department. Today, we have been enjoying a City Club of Cleveland Friday Forum featuring, featuring Catherine Spiller, Executive Director of the Feminist Majority Foundation and Executive Editor of Ms. Magazine. Thank you, Ms. Spiller. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Our forum is now adjourned.